Has this ever happened to you? Wow, I really want to use my home computer, but I'm stuck in this place surrounded by computers like, say, a school computer lab or a library, and I just don't know what to do. <gasps> I have an idea! I will remote desktop into my home computer from one of these. But how? Then boy do I have the solutions for you! I'm Chris Kalos, I like computers, and today I'll be looking over remote desktop software and comparing them to each other to find the ultimate one! for your use case. Remote desktop software are programs that allow you to access one computer from another. There are many forms of remote desktop ranging from a simple terminal interface through something like SSH to a full on low latency video feed of another PC. Today I'll be focusing on the latter form of remote desktop as it's useful for more people than a simple command line is and there's actual competition in this space whereas SSH is a one way road because it's an open standard. Several remote desktop software solutions will be tested and pitted against each other. The comments I make in this video are entirely subjective, but I will be trying to justify my opinions as much as possible. I run a poll here on the YouTube community tab about this topic, and I also recently uploaded a short video here on YouTube Shorts and on TikTok showing off a quick script that allows for quick remote desktop. While the TikTok comments didn't understand the assignment, so to speak, they gave me many ideas for what to include in this video. Along with the poll answers, the feedback really helped this project come together in one way or another, so I would like to thank everyone for participating in the conversation. I am not sponsored by anyone. No conflict of interest is involved. Without further ado, let's jump right into it with general purpose remote desktop software. Team Viewer Okay, you all expected this to be first on the list, and there are many good reasons for that. Firstly, according to the YouTube poll, most of the people that answered it are most familiar with TeamViewer, even if it beats out the second most popular option by a very small margin. Secondly, it is accessible from every major OS. There's a client for Windows, macOS, Linux, Android, iOS, and even the web. There's also a portable version available for Windows if you need it just once and don't want to install it. Thirdly, it's free for personal use, meaning you only need to pay for a license if you're using TeamViewer in a business setting, although TeamViewer are a bit shady about that, which I'll get to later. Lastly, TeamViewer was highly praised in my TikTok comments by casual users, so it clearly has the heart of the people. But is it really the best? Right off the bat, for me, TeamViewer gets points for committing to be Apple Silicon native from the very beginning. I am an M1 Mac user, so I really appreciate this move. Connecting to my Windows PC only took a couple of clicks after logging in. The cool thing about TeamViewer though, is that I don't even have to log in at all. With just a computer ID and a password, you can connect to any device that has TeamViewer open, from anywhere over the internet. The passwords are automatically generated every time the host system launches TeamViewer, even if unattended access is enabled. However, you can enable easy access, which allows you to connect to any of your devices without a password by logging into your account, although some may see this as a security risk. However, before adding any devices to my account, it asked me to verify whether I made the request via email, which is an extra layer of security that's pretty standard nowadays. Speaking of security, the connection protocol that TeamViewer uses is a proprietary one and apparently uses port 5938, but not much is known about it other than that its traffic is encrypted using RSA 4096 public-private key exchange and AES 256-bit session encryption. It's not publicly documented, so when TeamViewer claims that your connection is secure, you'll just have to take their word for it. For what it's worth though, TeamViewer is not really known to be a security risk and has been used by businesses for almost 20 years with very few cybersecurity incidents being associated with it. The latest one was in 2020 and the vulnerability was patched very quickly. When it comes to usability and reliability, TeamViewer is one of the most widely used remote desktop software and for good reason, it just gets the job done. I mean, don't get me wrong, it doesn't look the best nor does it feel the best to use, but it's not designed to be flashy. What's that? A family member or a friend needs tech support? No problem, just tell them to install TeamViewer and give you their ID and password and you're in. Actually, chances are they already have it installed because it's just so dang popular. You can always rely on TeamViewer to try to fight its way through even the most unreliable of connections, even if that means the quality will suffer. It also has some built-in communication features such as text and voice chat, but honestly I've never used these and they seem very outdated. One issue that I haven't run into myself but my friend Chris Mignotis brought up is that TeamViewer Business and TeamViewer Personal are the same product, despite one being paid and the other being free. 
As such, TeamViewer might sometimes mistakenly declare that you're using TeamViewer for business and limit your sessions to one minute if you use it too much, which is frankly very annoying and anti-consumer. For example, if you have a home server and you're running TeamViewer on it, never turning off the server might trip TeamViewer's usage detection thing and limit your sessions. TeamViewer's definition of what business use entails is so broad that legitimate home use cases like this fall under the category despite being, well, home use. And TeamViewer, the company, is notoriously difficult to negotiate with, perhaps on purpose, when it comes to such issues. They want you to pay. Even paying customers, though, have been known to have frequent complaints. It's just one of TeamViewer's anti-consumer behaviors, but for now I'll overlook it for the sake of testing the actual software. Video quality is alright. I've had mixed experiences. When connecting from my Mac to my Windows desktop on the same network, there's very little latency and the video and audio quality are great aside from a few weird graphical glitches I've encountered. However, when I connected from that same Windows PC to the Mac, for some reason it all went downhill. Look at this. Observe. Feast thine eyes upon this video unfolding in front of you and tell me that it doesn't look like crap. It does, there's no way around it. I don't know why this happens, I mean, I even tried disabling the background and changing the quality setting, but it's either going to look like crap or it's going to lag like hell while still looking like crap with no in between. It still gets the job done, don't get me wrong, but it's far from a good experience. Also, there's no sound when connecting to macOS hosts because of how macOS screen capture works. Other remote desktop and screen sharing solutions have found ways around this, but not TeamViewer. Let's test platform support. I installed TeamViewer Remote Control on my Android phone, which is only one of six TeamViewer apps on Android, each being used for a slightly different purpose. Connecting from my Android phone to my Windows PC was once again very easy, but the experience was mediocre at best, and just horrible at worst. I mean, you can't expect a 6-inch device with nothing but a touchscreen to try to replace the functions of a mouse and keyboard, but janky controls aside, it was just very finicky and laggy, which makes no sense, as these devices are all on the same network. Watching a YouTube video worked for a little while, but then froze up on me for no apparent reason, so this is definitely not suitable for media consumption or gaming. It kinda generally works, but it's just there to get the job done. I don't understand why Android to Windows works so badly when Mac to Windows works flawlessly, and I'm pretty sure the platform inconsistency is just random and continues beyond this. Just to exhaust all my options, I installed TeamViewer Host on my Android phone as well, but I couldn't get it to work. Maybe I have to install a third app to get the second app to work, or maybe I just have to install all six and pray to Cthulhu. I don't know. I won't bother. Overall, I appreciate TeamViewer's effort to provide options, however, I think sometimes their software ends up being finicky and unreliable as a result of trying to support so many platforms. There's no consistency between platforms, and I wish they'd document their software better and be more honest about how well it works under which conditions. With that out of the way, it's time to show the average viewer that there are more options than just TeamViewer. Let's move on to their most popular competitor... AnyDisk. AnyDesk is another piece of software that was highly praised in the TikTok comments and the YouTube poll. However, after trying it, I can confidently say that there is no real reason to use it unless you've gotten limited by TeamViewer. It essentially offers the same features as TeamViewer, but somehow manages to be even slower. Disgustingly so, in fact. You're gonna need a lot of patience if you're planning to do more than 5 clicks a minute on AnyDesk. If you're actually using the software commercially, AnyDesk has substantially cheaper pricing models compared to TeamViewer. But you get what you pay for. I think the footage you're seeing speaks for itself. There's no real way to make this look or work better than it is. Oh, and by the way, the footage is sped up. Its security protocol is less secure than TeamViewer's too, which is baffling in and of itself, considering that the security trade-off doesn't result in a faster connection. Basically, it's TeamViewer from Wish.com. I'm sorry, AnyDesk fans, I really cannot justify spending more time on this one. But what if you didn't have to install third-party programs to remote into your computer? Let's check out the three major desktop OS first-party solutions, starting with none other than... Microsoft Remote Desktop Yep, the built-in remote desktop software on Microsoft Windows. Not only was this the second most popular option in the YouTube poll, even being first for most of the polls run, but the TikTok comments on that short video were very quick to point out that my solution was needless when Microsoft Remote Desktop exists. Let's take a look. Is it all it's made out to be by its diehard fans? 
Immediately upon starting my research, I noticed Microsoft Remote Desktop is only available in the Pro and Enterprise versions of Windows. Automatically then, this lets us know that this software is not made for casual users, and many many people are practically locked out of using it. Strike 1. Microsoft clownery aside, Remote Desktop has official clients for Windows, Mac OS, Android, iOS, and the web. On Linux, you can use Remina instead, which can interface with Microsoft Remote Desktop. Sadly though, but perhaps predictably, hosting is only available on Windows systems running an aforementioned Pro or Enterprise version. Big oof. I can only test this one way then, connecting from my Mac or my phone into my Windows PC. Strike 2. The power of Microsoft Remote Desktop becomes apparent when using general purpose software like Office Suites or Sysadmin tools from another device on the same network. Latency is kept to a minimum, and the text and any UI elements are as sharp as your host OS would typically be because Remote Desktop adjusts the resolution to match the client's display. On a MacBook, or just anything with the Retina display, it can even optimize for it, and the macOS client is also M1 native, which is a huge plus for me. Microsoft Remote Desktop integrates natively with Windows, and you can even pass through devices like your microphone, webcam, printers, and storage on supported devices. Sheesh! This is especially handy with iOS and Android devices if you don't have a webcam on your computer. Although, I've had a rocky experience with this feature. Sharing an iPad's microphone to a Windows PC and using it on Discord resulted in a choppy, unintelligible robot voice, so I can't really guarantee that this feature works all the time. The webcam was fine though, and hey, if you've ever wondered what it's like to use Windows with a touchscreen, Microsoft Remote Desktop is the best way to try it out. Unfortunately, Remote Desktop comes with a number of downsides because of the protocol's nature. The protocol, named RDP, is pretty old and it's really starting to show its age and its limitations. It requires port 3398 to be open in order to connect, as it was designed for local networks like businesses where there's no firewall between devices. This is fine on your home network if you're just in the other room, but it can be a nightmare if you're trying to connect from outside your local network. Port forwarding is an option, but it's a significant cybersecurity risk. I mean, you're literally opening a port to your IP address to the public internet. Not fun. Another option would be self-hosting a VPN for your home network, but that's outside of the scope of this video. Adding to the quirks, when you connect to your RDP session, Windows will disconnect your main screen from your user. This means you can't be using your machine both physically and through remote desktop at the same time. Finally, the compression algorithm of RDP is outdated and cannot keep up with any sort of video or game. Because of these issues, RDP can only be useful for machines you want to control inside your house for basic tasks or for headless systems and servers. Strike 3 and you're out. In my eyes, it's disqualified from this competition because it needs tedious setup to connect over the internet from anywhere, but I won't be so quick to push its usefulness aside over this one transgression. Next up... Apple, Apple Remote, Remote Desktop. Desktop Did you know macOS apparently has a native remote desktop client made by Apple? I can't wait to try it out! It costs 80 euro and there's no trial. It costs 80 euro and there's no trial. That's a no from me, Apple. I can't test this, I don't live in a mansion. Maybe I'll make enough YouTube money out of this video to afford this stupid thing, but I probably won't buy it anyway. Next! Chrome Remote Desktop. I'm gonna be honest, I'm not very big on browsers doing everything nowadays. Maybe I'm just cynical, but I just don't like the hypothetical future where everything is done through an internet browser. Alas, Chrome Remote Desktop seems to be loved by many, as is evident by my TikTok comments, so I gave it a chance. After all, with so many students using Chromebooks nowadays, it's one of their only options, and I assume it works great on Chrome OS. Installing it is a bit sketchy. There's a companion app to go along with the Chrome extension, which is required if you want to be able to host, either for remote access or remote support. It's pretty standard to have companion apps for this kind of thing, because it requires permissions. I would assume remote access means you're able to access your own computer through your account, and remote support is for sharing your desktop with another person via code. After installation, you actually have to set up the computer for hosting, which is very straightforward, all you have to do is give it a name. Then, by logging into a Chromium-based browser with your Google account, you can access that computer from anywhere. It did try to get me to install Google Chrome instead of Microsoft Edge, despite Edge being Chromium-based, but I can confirm it works the same way on Microsoft Edge. 
I don't know how I feel about a browser running constantly in the background on my computer though. RAM is precious. On the flip side, maybe it's better to have a browser extension that does the same thing as a dedicated app. Although this technically is a dedicated app, just disguised as a browser extension, I digress. Performance is alright. It's very comparable to TeamViewer, although it actually looks better and feels a bit more consistent. It uses WebRTC, which is the same technology apps like Discord use to transmit video. It's pretty secure, as it must use SRTP encryption to be classified as WebRTC, and I trust Google of all companies to be honest about their protocol because, well, they made WebRTC. Surely they won't lie about using it. Overall, pretty solid. It doesn't selectively render some elements better than others, like TeamViewer. It's just all around alright. The user interface is definitely the most noob friendly out of all the remote control software we've tested so far, although at times it can be a bit too simple. Uninstalling it was a bit sketchy too though. I had to look up how to uninstall it, which is never a good sign. Basically, there was an uninstaller app in the applications folder, but for some reason it didn't show up on the launch pad. After this, I also had to uninstall the Chrome extension. I can confirm the uninstaller worked, but I don't know if it left any residue per se, and there's no way to check for it. Anyway. On to more web-based technologies. DWService.net I was not aware of the existence of this. Apparently it's been around for a few years. Fellow YouTuber Excelsior Tech, great videos by the way, made a comment in the YouTube poll letting me know of the existence of DW Service. He says, DWService.net has a really cool free option. I have tried many even way back in the early VNC days. Parsec is the most performant for personal use, but lately I've been really happy with DWS for family tech support. It's convenient, web-based, and perhaps most importantly, open source. They make money by offering paid services with more features, but there's also a free plan. I was surprised that something like this existed, to say the least, and I was even more surprised that I'd never heard of it. While I was at home during May for spring break, my friend Chris Miniotis had been going to work, so he was kind enough to test DW service for me by connecting from his work computer to his home PC. Take it away, Chris. Hi, Chris. Thank you for having me on the channel. DW service impressed me during my short time with it, as it's very similar to the other solutions in performance, but doesn't need to be installed on the computer you want to connect from. Since it's just a website, you just go to the address, log in, and connect to your computer at home. It only relies on an HTTPS connection. There's no chance of it being blocked unless your administrator blocks that specific website. However, given that it is only HTTPS, it is forced to go through the DW service servers, and that introduces additional latency. Performance felt comparable to AnyDesk, which is to say usable, but not enjoyable. However, the reliability of this website could be really handy if you're stuck at your grandma's house or something. It should be noted that not much is known about the protocol used, other than that it's based on HTTPS, so it is technically as secure as your browser. Back to you, Chris. Last on our list is a slightly gaming-oriented solution that also happens to work great for general purpose use. Parsec. Up until this year, I remembered Parsec as a software that allowed you to play local co-op games through the internet. I didn't really understand it back when it first came out in 2016, I was young, less knowledgeable, and just enough outside the target audience to be able to ignore its existence completely. While that was, in fact, Parsec's original purpose, it has evolved to become a full-blown remote desktop software. And let me tell you, I was blown away by its performance. Once again, I was influenced by my friend Chris Miniotis here. He started using it extensively to remote into his home PC from our college computers, and I started doing the same, as did many of our friends. In fact, He's the one that made the script I showed off in that short video that I was talking about in the beginning. Lastly, Parsec was bought out by Unity, the game engine company, in late 2021. Despite this, Parsec is still an independent project that gets regular updates. It's free for personal use, and unlike TeamViewer, Parsec for individuals and Parsec for teams are different products, so you'll never get a pop-up nagging you to purchase a license. So, how does Parsec stack up to everything else we've checked out so far? Well firstly, it takes a completely different approach compared to the rest of the industry by using the latest video compression and streaming technology to achieve the lowest latency possible. It can do H.264 and H.265 encoding and decoding, and the connection is peer-to-peer -peer and encrypted with DTLS 1.2. 
It supports and actually encourages hardware encoding and decoding, so you can put that GPU to work to have a smoother experience if you so desire. Parsec's documentation on their technical specifications is actually quite good. It can be found on their website quite easily, unlike certain other companies, <coughs> Team Viewer. By default, Parsec uses pretty much random ports, but you can specify the host and client ports to whatever you want if, for example, your organization doesn't allow those ports to be opened. However, you do not need to do any sort of port forwarding on most networks that don't block UDP traffic by default. Parsec's focus on low latency pays off because aside from showing video compression artifacts on unreliable connections, it is incredibly fast. It was originally designed for gaming, so obviously the latency is so low that even gaming through Parsec is viable under good conditions. I admit, I've played a fair bit of teamfight tactics on college computers by remoting into my home PC via Parsec, and Mignotis has done a fair bit of DJing through it. While it cannot grab the client machine's microphone and webcam like RDP, it does support controller input on top of mouse and keyboard, which is a unique quirk of this software. Also, unlike the rest of the software that we've tested so far, there's no clipboard syncing, no file sharing, basically nothing that isn't a video and audio stream. If you have a very reliable connection though, you can customize the settings to transmit uncompressed audio as well, which is a nice touch if you're doing something like music production on a remote machine. So, let's talk ease of use. Once you make an account, you can register your computers by logging in with two-factor authentication via email, after which point you can access any one of your computers from anywhere through your account. You can also add friends on Parsec who can allow you access to their computers. Remember, this was made for gaming together. Of course, you can't just access anyone's computer all willy-nilly. They have to accept your request every time, so it's not unsafe to add someone as a friend on Parsec as long as you trust them. Parsec can also be configured to run at startup before logon so that you can simply press the power button on your home PC and not worry about it before leaving the house. For this to work, you do need to install Parsec system-wide, not just for your own user, so go through the installation process carefully. Compatibility is where Parsec starts to falter. First of all, it requires a somewhat newer computer to host a Parsec session. While a dedicated GPU is not required per se, it is highly recommended, along with a newer processor and operating system than something like TeamViewer or any desk would require. Secondly, although there are client apps for Windows, with a portable version available, macOS, Linux, Chrome browsers, Android, and even Raspberry Pi running Raspbian, hosting is only limited to Windows, with macOS hosting in beta right now. iOS is notably absent from the list of supported clients. There is no app for Parsec on the iOS App Store, and even through the web interface, Parsec is a simple black screen, thanks to everyone's favorite browser, Safari. In case you didn't know, on iOS, every browser is a glorified Safari wrapper. This means that no matter what browser you install on your iPhone or iPad, or iPod Touch if anyone still uses those, Parsec will always be a black screen because it requires a Chromium-based browser to function. To make matters worse for Parsec on the Apple front, my experience with macOS hosting has been... bad. Don't get me wrong, it's fast, and it looks just as good as Windows hosting, something I cannot say about software like, say, TeamViewer and AnyDesk, but it does have very fundamental issues as of the making of this video. The app isn't native to Apple Silicon, which in the year 2022 is quite strange, and there are also critical bugs on macOS hosts, like being unable to open the dock through another client, rendering the system very difficult to use, and a system softlock bug where the whole OS becomes unresponsive to anything but a Parsec client if another computer connects and then disconnects from it. That last one forced me to shut down my Mac to restore input, and I haven't tested macOS hosting ever since. Take my experience with a grain of salt though, because it's been a few months since then and critical bugs may have been fixed in the meantime. Android compatibility is alright. It's fast and smooth, but the controls consist of trying to use a Windows PC with only a phone touchscreen, without changing the scaling from your normal PC monitor. Unlike TeamViewer, Parsec on Android doesn't have special ways to control the mouse like a trackpad-style control scheme. What you see is what you get, essentially. It is, however, really useful for streaming games to an Android device and using its controller input to control the game on the remote PC. Although, according to Parsec, this can be unreliable depending on your Android phone and your controller and the combination of the two, etc, etc. If you'd like a Parsec-like experience that does work on iOS, I've heard Rainway is an alternative, but it's not mature enough yet to compare, and its iOS support is still in beta, and lastly, I also haven't used it.
I hope you found this video useful, and I hope it's clear now that the industry leader doesn't always have the best solution for everyone. While TeamViewer gets the job done for many people, if you're looking for something more specific, there's probably software out there that better meets your needs. For organizations in the Microsoft ecosystem running on a local network, RDP seems like one of the best options, while for general purpose, Parsec or Chrome Remote Desktop or even DWService.net might be better. It all really depends on what you need, unless we're talking about AnyDesk. Nobody should be using AnyDesk. Please don't use AnyDesk. I'm Chris Kalos, I like computers, and I hope to see you in the next video.